problems in your body or a situation that you're, you're dealing with, it's the name of Jesus that brings the power. It's the name of Jesus. We go to our Father in heaven in the name of Jesus. We go boldly before the throne of grace through the blood and the body of Jesus and in the name of Jesus. There's one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Amen? And to know the power of his name. Well, today we're going to continue our study in 1 Corinthians, but we get to go to a real hot topic today. And I don't know why, but it really is a hot topic. The issue of speaking in tongues in church services and how we are to have special gifts of the Holy Spirit in operation in the church. Now, I don't know why or how this topic has become such a, a, a hot button, but it is. Anybody notice that? And here it is on this day. We didn't plan what day we're going to do it on, but at the beginning of January, we decided we're going to preach through this, so you're here today for a reason. Amen? And... I go back a couple of years ago, three, four years ago, and we were having a prayer meeting, and we had a, a visiting young lady here in her early 20s, and I thought, wow, it's nice to have someone come join us that I don't know for a prayer meeting. And, but little did I know is that during the prayer meeting, she, she was escalating in her anger, and I had no idea what was going on. I'm not very good at getting blindsided. Now, how about you? I react real bad. <laughs> Calm down. Uh, but... She wanted to meet with me after church, and so I know ben, Pastor Ben was there, and my son Luke, and Tanner Loaf was in there, and we kind of went in my office, and, and she began to grill me. How dare you let people speak in tongues like that with none of it being interpreted? You are not doing what the Bible says. The Bible says right here that you should be silent in church. And I'm like, whoa. <clears throat> Okay, and I opened my Bible and I showed her the difference between being baptized in the Holy Spirit in your personal prayer life and you're given a personal prayer language that you and the Lord get to have and, and that you don't know what you're saying personally, but it's God praying through you. We don't know the mind of the Lord, but the Lord has given us the Holy Spirit that we might know the mind of Christ, amen. Went through all these things. Now, the difference between that and what happens in church when everyone's looking at one person and one person speaks in tongues, that needs to be interpreted. Oh, and she just kept pushing me and she got, extremely aggressive and extremely rude and I mean I can't see people getting hardly upset about that over a, a whole bunch of different things but she was mad and she kept pushing me and pushing me and I wasn't quite ready for it and finally she goes what do you think of people who don't believe in this well you know no. oh, what do you think of people and she kept pushing me and finally I go they're stupid okay Now, I shouldn't have said that, nor do I believe it, and I regret for saying that today, but it was like, girl, would you just shut up? <laughs> I'm sorry, I know the rest of you would handle that much better. I did not. But, so let's look what the Bible says. You know, as God moves among us and things happen, it isn't what we think the Bible says. It isn't what our tradition says. It isn't what makes me feel comfortable that we go with. We go with what the Bible says. Amen? I've challenged people for years. We're going to take all the scriptures on baptizing babies over here and all the scriptures on speaking in tongues over here and we're going to do the one we find more of. What are we going to find more of? Speaking in tongues, you're going to find nothing on baptizing babies. But why do people want to? They want to hold on the false doctrine, but the real doctrines people want to throw away. Let's not do that. Everybody look at your neighbor and go, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to follow the word. Tell your neighbor that. So let's look at the Bible, and let's live according to what it says. Now remember back when we were in chapter 12, when it gives us a list of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and some of them would be called charisma gifts, grace gifts. They're different than the baptism in the Holy Spirit, but the baptism in the Holy Spirit is the doorway into the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Remember the context is always this. Chapter 12 was the context of the church gathering, of the body. We are the body. And when we get together, th certain things start to happen. God gives special promises about when we get together and that there's gifts that are happening, things that are beginning to go on during the church. And then we, uh, uh, we, we spent time with a message of love of chapter 13, making sure that the pathway to the gifts of the Holy Spirit need to be paved 
with love. So let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, starting with verse number 1. Let love be your highest goal, but you should also desire special abilities the Holy Spirit gives, especially the ability, ability of prophecy. Now, what we must understand right off the bat is that what matters when we gather together is that there's understanding, intelligibility, that there's communication. That's why it says that we desire especially the gift of prophecy. Love is our highest goal. Therefore, we measure a good church service on the basis of did we love each other? Did we care for each other? Did we bear one another's burdens? Did we give and serve another person? And in loving others, do we allow the Holy Spirit to, loop, to move in a powerful way? Now, hear what I said. In loving others, do we allow the Holy Spirit to move in a powerful way to bring them whatever they need? Some people need encouragement, so they need a word of encouragement. Some people need healing, so we need to bring them healing. Some people need to be delivered. We want to bring them deliverance. It all comes by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Look at verse number two. For if you have the ability to speak in tongues, you will be talking only to God since people won't be able to understand you. You will be speaking by the power of the Spirit, but it will, but it will all be mysterious. Now let's look at a few things. Every believer can and I believe should be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Do you need to speak in tongues to go to heaven? No. If you don't want it, that's cool. Don't, no one's going to push it on you. Are we going to talk about it here? Yeah. Yeah, we're going to talk about it here because it's available to us. It's like a, people gathering together for, in army barracks saying, yes, we're going to go to war, but I'm so sick of that guy talking about guns. He just wouldn't talk about guns all the time. But we're going to war. Oh, I don't want to hear about army tanks and airplanes. But we're going to war. Oh, sure, now you want to talk about bullets. Yeah. Because God has given us powerful things that he wants us to use for his glory. God has distributed them among us and all of us that God wants to use us in these things so we should have them. Amen? But not everyone will be used in every gift. And not everyone will be used in the gifts of speaking in tongues that need to be interpreted in church. I pray in tongues almost every day. But I've only been used one time in 30 years in giving of a tongue that needed to be interpreted in church. One time. I think God wanted to do more. I probably just chickened out. Now, look at the insight into our personal prayer languages that were just given in, those, in the verse number two. Number one, you will be talking with God. When a person is baptized in the Holy Spirit, they know they're baptized in the Holy Spirit when they begin to pray in a language they do not know. I've told you about being all over the world and people knowing what I'm saying, but I don't know what I was saying. That's all true. It's been proven over and over again. It's absolutely true. It's absolutely good. But more, most importantly, the First Corinthians starts out saying, we don't know the mind of God. We don't know what God wants. Who knows the thoughts of a man except the man's spirit within him? Who knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God? And God has given us all things by his spirit. How do I get them to know the mind of Christ? Man, I, when we're praying over a situation, we begin to pray in a language you don't know. You pray in English. Then you pray in a language you don't know. And God begins to pray through you in a language you don't know and begins to deposit in you information you don't have and begins to pray before God things that you could never pray in your natural mind. It's like cheating. But we win. Do you have to do this? No. If you want to go to war without bullets, you go ahead. Now it says, others don't understand. And when I'm praying in tongues, neither do I. I don't know what I'm saying, but I've been in India, I've been in Africa, I've been here. People say, wow, I heard you say something. In fact, two weeks, a week ago, a week ago, if I understand it, I was, I was not at the prayer meeting, but there was a tongue and, a, an interpre and the interpretation was because that person was speaking in French. Did I have that right, Jocelyn? Ah, Jocelyn and, and Isabella, they speak French. They grew up in Togo. They speak French fluently. And someone gave a tongue, and the tongue was French. And he says, here's the scripture they just said. It was in our prayer meeting a week ago. 
It was quoting of a scripture in Isaiah. Jeremiah, some, say yes, no. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the Pastor John was telling me about this because God was doing, showing us miracles, that God knows things. God can do things. Amen? Now, you'll be speaking by the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, I just want to experience God. I just don't think God's there for me. Well, then ask him for the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Ask him for more. He's got more for you. You can experience every moment of every day. And it's a bit mysterious. It is a bit mysterious, and therefore, two things have happened. People are scared of it, and some people just get freaky with it. Right. It's true. I mean, if you're going to look for weirdos, you don't look for them in a dead church. All the nut jobs show up here. That's us. Everybody look at your neighbor and say, he's talking about you. (laughs) Go to verse 3. Look at verse 3 says. It's going to probably take us two weeks to probably go over all this. But one who prophesies strengthens others, encourages, the, encourages them, and comforts them. A person who speaks in tongues is strengthened personally. But the one who speaks a word of prophecy strengthens the church. What is prophecy? In a technical sense, I am prophesying because I'm telling you the word of God. But that's not what I'm speaking of here. Prophecy is when the Holy Spirit comes on someone in a spontaneous way. And all of a sudden, it's God is speaking through them. God is spontaneously, by the Holy Spirit, do they go into some kind of freaky, weird trance? What? No. No. You know, when the Lord speaks to you, you, you've heard him in like just that yes, mm, yeah, or that kind of weird feeling, mm, no. That's God speaking. In the same way, he can move on you and actually give you a prophetic word. We've had prophetic words move, and, and prophetic words sometimes can be what also is called a word of knowledge. In other words, one time Pastor John had uh, a word of knowledge back at the soundboard, and he came forward, he said, I can't get this off me, man. This is freaking me out. I hear God saying, someone here is planning to commit suicide. I go, John. And he tested. He said, God, is this you? God, is this you? And I said, well, dude, just go up. I mean, what are we going to lose? Let's try. So Pastor John came up and he goes, I just feel there's someone here right now. You're thinking about suicide. And God wants you to know he knows and he loves you and he has a plan. Do you know that three different people came to him? Took a while. But God was moving upon him. He had a prophetic word with a word of knowledge combined. Should Pastor John have been quiet because I'm uncomfortable with people speaking out in church? No. We've had sometimes where the Holy Spirit's moved on someone and they said, attention, it's time to go to battle, church. It's time to pray. It's time to clean up your lives and live holy. Have you ever heard one of those? It's God. It's God moving. He says, I want you to know what I'm saying right now. It's a, that's a prophecy. Now, prophecy is, is being moved upon by the Holy Spirit. Now, we are given the standard by which we are to measure prophecy. It says that these words are to strengthen people, encourage people, and comfort people. Well, sometimes these prophetic words are negative. Sometimes they're calling us to get sin out of our lives. Well, guess what? When we get sin out of our lives, that's a positive thing, isn't it? And it's God calling us to something positive, something powerful through the Holy Spirit, to strengthen, to encourage. Sometimes the prophetic words have come out in church where just someone says, the Lord is saying, I am there for you, I love you, you're hurting. And sometimes there's specific situations. I had a relative here one time who was, came up here before he was going home then to divorce his wife. And there was a prophetic word in our church, and none of you even know about this, but I do. It was a prophetic word. This was over 10 years ago. And the prophetic word is, don't give, there was someone crying out. I mean, it got quiet, and then a person spoke out in church. Don't give up on your marriage. Don't give up on your marriage. I have a plan for you. Well, that person is still married today because of that prophetic word. That God came and spoke and told him exactly what he wanted. Praise God. But you know what? The people around the person who gave the prophetic work are going, ooh, they're speaking out again. Oh, why do they always, oh, I brought grandma today. And, oh, and then she's going to do that. Oh. <laughs> Have you ever felt like that? 
Raise your hand so other people can acknowledge it. Put your hand. You felt uncomfortable when something like that's going on. But let me tell you, we've got to get over it because this is the Bible. We've got to stop being stupid Americans and be Christians. There are people that are coming that are broken and they need an encounter with God, but we're so uncomfortable we say no. That's got to stop. We need God. Let me tell you, as your pastor... I will do everything I can to make sure things are done decently in order. I have no problem ordering body bags. <laughs> Kidding. Kidding. We've had people come in here and do weird things, and I've stopped them and told them to leave. We have people walking around trying to prophesy over people doing weird stuff. God told me to tell you stuff. Just weird, creepy things. And I've kicked them out of church. I'll do everything I can to protect this church. That's what God's called me to do. But I also want to have an environment where we have an opportunity to step out in faith and say, I believe God's saying this. I believe God's doing this. And God will do miracles among us. Amen? I believe there's more miracles than what we've ever seen that God wants to do. Do you believe that? Then we've got to say yes to his word. Look at verse number five. I wish you could all speak in tongues. But, more, but even more, I wish you could all prophesy for prophecy is greater than speaking in tongues unless someone interprets what you are saying so that the whole church will be strengthened. What's the purpose here? Remember, there's my personal prayer language. Boom. Because on the day of Pentecost, they all spoke in tongues. Every time I look in the Bible, day of Pentecost, uh, Acts chapter 19, Acts chapter 10, it says they all received. They all received. But then there is this gifts that happen in the church. And when we gather together, the thing that matters is that people understand. Could you, what would it be like if Jenny just led her piano, played beautifully, but just spoke in another language? You'd all be sitting there going, would you get on to a song I know? And even, you know, she taught us a new song today, great song, right? But because you didn't know it, it took a while to get it. it took a while, and then we finally got to, oh, I exalt, oh, we all know that one. Oh, it's just so good. Why? What was it? What, what is it? We understood. Now, when we are together, what's the point? The point is to build others up. The spiritual gifts do not, um, they're there to bring understanding. And when people don't understand what's being said, it doesn't make any sense. What was happening in the Corinthian church is they thought it was so spiritual just to everybody speak in tongues for an hour and a half together and go home. That wasn't a blessing to anybody. They're getting. <laughs> Verse number six, let's read it. Dear brothers and sisters, if I should come to you speaking in an unknown language, how would that help you? But if I bring you a revelation or some special knowledge or prophecy or teaching, that will be helpful. Even lifeless instruments like a flute or a harp must play the notes clearly or no one will recognize the melody. And if the bugler doesn't sound a clear call, how will the soldiers know they are being called to battle? It is the same for you. If you speak to people in words they don't, don't understand, how will they know what you are, you are seeing? You might as well be talking into empty space. The problem in Corinth was the church believed that speaking in tongues was the highest form of proving they were spiritual. So when the church came together, it was crazy time. Here's the point. When everyone is focusing on one person and listening to them, that communication must end in understanding for the people who are hearing. Because during church today, more than likely, as the music was in between words or in between verses, or in, you more than likely heard people worshiping God in an unknown language. Did anybody hear anybody speaking in tongues around you? Oh, you're a bunch of weirdos. Ugh. Oh, what's wrong? Oh, oh, I don't want to come here anymore. Oh. I see people act like that all the time. Why? I don't get it. I don't understand. But we have to understand through the scriptures. Amen? We want to understand what the scriptures tell us. Verse 10. There are many different languages in the world, and 
Every language has meaning. But if I don't understand the language, I will be a foreigner to someone who speaks it. And the one who speaks it will be a foreigner to me. And the same is true of you. Since you are so eager to have spiritual abilities the Spirit gives, seek those that strengthen the whole church. Seek to do something that helps other people. The expression of spiritual gifts is never about you. Now, right now you're going, yeah, what's the big deal? I have been in the middle of hot situations where people who wanted to express their spiritual gifts almost got violent because they wanted to prophesy and they wanted to do this and they wanted their expressions. And it got ugly. I had a husband and wife here years ago come into my office and they gave me strict instructions. And this is the instructions. My wife likes to prophesy but she doesn't want any type of judgment of what she said. She doesn't like it being any negativity coming her way, so when she prophesies, we don't want you to say anything. I said, too bad. We are going to weigh what is said according to the word of God, and if you're off, we're going to say you're off. Guess what? They left the church over that. Now look what it says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 19. I don't know if I have that in the, it might not be on the PowerPoint, but I'll read it for you. It says, uh, do not stifle the Holy Spirit. So way, don't quench the Holy Spirit. Do not scoff at prophecies. In verse 21 says, but test everything that is said and hold to what is good. We all have the Holy Spirit as a believer we have the Holy Spirit in us. And we are not going to allow ourselves to be manipulated by anybody. We've had people who, over the many years I've been here, who have come in and declared themselves to be prophets. And we've tested them and we found out they weren't prophetic, they were pathetic. <laughs> but they wanted to tell you 73 times that they were prophetic. If someone's prophetic, they don't have to tell you over and over again. There will be signs. There will be fruit to their life. And God will show everyone. You don't have to declare it yourself. Just live a holy life and do what God allows you to do. Amen? I don't want my prophecies being judged. Well, then go somewhere else. Well, that's not nice, Pastor. Yeah, it is when you're a shepherd of a flock and you're trying to protect all the sheep. That is extremely nice to kill wolves. Amen? Amen? Verse 13. So anyone who speaks in tongues should pray also for the ability to interpret what has been said. For if I pray in tongues, my spirit prays, but I don't understand what I'm saying. Wow, well, look at that. And then remember, I'm reading you the Bible. I'm not reading you my book. I'm reading you God's book. Okay? We should pray that we could also flow in the gift of interpretation. If God moves on you, I would think the most despised gift that is happening in the Northland is when someone would, would let's say, when it got real quiet in church. We had a, a time between songs there, and it got quiet, and Jenny kind of walks over. She said, if I put my hand up like that, she's going to slow down. If I've, if we're going to wait. And let's say someone all of a sudden starts speaking in tongues. Ooh, some people get creeped out. But then if that happens, if that happens, there has to be then an interpretation of what that person said. Otherwise, that person who is saying that should be quiet. If it is a gift of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will come and that person will speak in tongues and that person also then can uh, interpret what they said. But do all the rest of us sit back and go, oh, you're so spiritual, and I'm a dirt ball. Oh, you're so awesome, I'm going to worship at your feet. Why do people do that? We are such superstar worshipers in America. We all have the Holy Spirit, and we just worship Jesus. 
And if something goes on, let's say there's a, a tongue, an interpretation of tongue, and we're all going, nah. Do we then make that person into a villain? Oh, you're evil. Come out in Jesus' name. No! Now what's been happening is more and more lately in the last two months during our prayer meeting on Saturday, there's been tongues and interpretation of tongues more than we've had in a couple of years. Years ago we had more tongue and interpretation tongue when our congregation was smaller and it was easier to hear everyone. But there's some type of fear and terror of letting that go in church. Would you agree that that's true? What we need to do is say, Holy Spirit, move on me. And it shouldn't be, hmm, I wonder if that's God. Well, I wonder if it's not God. It should be, boom, it's God. We should ask him for that. We should ask him for that. And it isn't that we ever get out of control. We're going to read that next week, that the spirit of each person is under their own control. You can't go, well, I just couldn't help myself. I had to bounce off the walls. No, you didn't. Well, I just needed to roll on the floor. No, you didn't. Do you know why people fall down when they get prayed for sometimes? They can't stand up. (laughs) Anybody ever seen that one? Someone gets prayed for? Okay. Uh, It's never happened to me. And I've been all over the world. It's never happened to me. I would love for it to happen to me, but here's the problem. When we want something like that so bad, it can become a crowd dynamic and people can get manipulated into it. <gasps> They're going to pray for people. We're going to get into the prayer line and everyone's falling over, so I should fall over too. <laughs> One time, myself, did you go with us? My son Luke, who's 6'5", Tanner, who's 6'4", my son Eric, who's 6'3", we went to Emmanuel Christian Center where Carlos Anacondia was preaching. Anybody ever heard of Carlos Anacondia? Well, if you were Spanish, you would know a whole lot more about Carlos Anacondia. He's from, he's from Argentina. I've been down to Argentina. I've been prayed for by Carlos a couple of times. And this was a Spanish service first, and then they interpreted it into English. It was amazing. 3,000 people at Emmanuel Christian Center. And we would, guys, let's go up and get prayed for by Carlos Anacondia. And so we walk up, and here's the funny part. It's people getting prayed for. Luke, Tanner, me, Eric, people getting prayed for. Because <laughs> all our Hispanic brothers and sisters were a little bit shorter than us. And Carlos comes along and he reaches out to pray for us. And we're all just like, that was cool. We're all standing. Everybody is on the floor around us. I don't know why. But we all just stood there like, okay, this is cool. And the catchers were going, praise God. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes those things happen are we going to freak out if they happen no but let's let's not just go after those things we're going after Jesus we're going after Jesus some of these things are mysteries verse 15 well then what should we do? Well, we should stop all this craziness happening in church. That's just absolutely for certain. We're going to stop it because this just freaks Grandma out and she doesn't want to come back. Well, what's the Bible say? What's the Bible? Well, then, what should we do? He says, I will pray in the Spirit, and I will also pray in words I understand. I will sing in the Spirit, and I will also sing in words I understand. What the Apostle Paul is saying, just because some people do weird things, let's not let them steal an experience from God from us. Ever been in a service? We've had it happen twice in 18 years where the Holy Spirit moves on one of the worship singers and they begin to sing in tongues and then they interpret what they said in singing. Has anybody ever seen that? Just a couple. Well, here it says, because why are we saying this? If it happens among us, we have to say these words. Is it in the Bible? And if it's not in the Bible, then I've got to start going, hold it. Hold it. Because our experience doesn't dictate the word of God. The word of God dictates our experience. So God may move on a singer one day. Because right now, we're in that time where we're like a little asleep. 
Remember when I talked about a couple weeks ago if Jesus was sitting right here, what would be the difference? But the fact is, he is. We're just asleep to the fact. He is here right now. He knows everything about you. He knows your blood pressure. He knows what you're going through. He knows every need you have. He knows every part of you. He knows how many hairs are on your head. He knows everything. But the fact is, we're just a little sleepy to it. But when he comes and brings revival, we become awakened to it. And his nearness is so real. When that happens, this stuff begins to happen more. So we could be in the middle of one of those times where we're just worshiping the Lord and God moves on somebody and they begin to sing in tongues and then they begin to they, they interpret in singing. Is that biblical? Yes, it is. Paul said, What should I do? Well, I will I will pray in tongues and I'll pray in my understanding. I will sing in tongues and I will sing in my understanding. He says that's perfectly normal in church. It's perfectly normal. But now Let's look at the next verse, verse 16. For if I praise God only in the Spirit. Now here's the thing. Because we've walked away from so many things of God, we're not on the other end of the spectrum. These people, this is all they did. We were northerners. We're Scandinavians. We're Germans. And it, man, we got to we got to prime to pump and we got to get people going. We got to sing sappy songs before people even feel anything. But there's those times when we begin to sing. We sing in the Spirit and God begins to move among us. Those times, I actually had an Assembly of God church join us and they came to our men's thing and they heard men speaking in tongues. They freaked out. People aren't supposed to hear you speak in tongues. Straight in the Bible. Really? Where is it in the Bible? Because on the day of Pentecost, all of them were speaking in tongues, and all the people were listening. People heard them speaking in tongues. Why are we ashamed of that which is of God? Because some people are weird. Let's just agree with it. Right? Some people just do freaky stuff, invade our space, and make us feel uncomfortable. Have you ever had that happen on the road? Another person driving too close to you, getting right up behind you, honking, being rude. Anybody had that when you were on the, on the road? Anybody saw another crazy driver? <gasps> okay, hand in your keys. No one is going to drive because there's crazy people out there. There's people who've had accidents and we can't have that. Hand in your keys, we're all walking home. Now, none of us are going to do that. So why, when it comes to the things of God, do we want to pull back? You see, there's a healthy balance, and I like what Rick Warren said. Rick Warren said that if you have tongues and interpretation of tongues or prophecy, and you stop and tell people in church what's happening, you're seeker-sensitive. In that way, I, we're seeker-sensitive. Because when it happens in church, because I've actually then people on the other end of the spectrum, how come every time there's a prophecy, Pastor Tom has to explain it all the time? I wish I had a dollar for every time somebody whined. I mean, I've actually had people say that. You know why I do that? Because everybody in this room deserves to know what's going on. Everyone in this room needs to understand, what was that? Well, my friend, if there's just one, I need to go, no, that's what it says in the Bible. It says right here that this happens in church. And then they go, oh, okay. But there's still times when it's seemingly biblical, but there's something wrong. How many people were here a number of years ago, and this is before we had the risers up, and there was a man sat right back there, and he thought it was his job to go into church and shout in tongues at the top of his voice. You guys remember that Sunday? I remember I stood up and I said, dude, what is the matter with you? You scared the junk out of me. Don't ever do that again. Why? Because it's not supposed to be rude. And that guy wasn't doing it because it was even tongues. When you get that nail on a chalkboard feeling when something's happening it's more than likely the Holy Spirit inside of you going warning warning danger Will Robinson danger Will Robinson I mean some of you are old enough <laughs> that's the Holy Spirit going off on the inside going something's wrong with that have you ever had that happen I have 
There's something wrong with that. And then sometimes there's a word given in church and you're just like, I don't know. Well, let's sing another song. You ever had that happen? I have, all the time. It's like, I don't know what to do with it. It sounded good to me. And then somebody will come up there after the church and goes, that person was speaking to me. What was that? How'd they know that about me? And I go, well, that was just a prophetic word that God was showing you. And to me, it meant nothing. Sometimes it's just God encouraging someone through the prophetic gifts. We want these things to happen. Four of us do. Okay. (laughs) The rest of you are going, I'm not quite sure. Because we live in a world today that does not accept these things. Many churches don't allow them to happen on a Sunday morning. We want to allow them to happen on a Sunday morning. I believe they should happen more at a prayer meeting. But I also believe they do happen. And when they do, we ask people to come up and use the microphone so there's, everything's done decently and in order. But there will be times when people, it'll happen. And we have to weigh what is said according to the word of God. So let's go back to verse 16 again. For if I praise God in the spirit, how can anyone... How can those who don't understand you pra- uh, praising God, uh, praise God along with you? How can they join in your thanksgiving when they don't understand what you are saying? You will be giving thanks very well, but it won't strengthen the people who hear you. What he's saying is there's times when we have the words up here, we're all singing together. Sometimes those words go away, we worship God, and, but not everyone's focusing on one person. At that point, that's when we sing in the spirit. We sing in our understanding. We're singing. In between every song, you shouldn't be sitting there waiting like a concert. Well, when's the next one coming up? That's not worship. That's a song service. We don't have song services. We have worship time. And these people are just simply assisting us up here. We're not staring at them. I wonder what I should do next. (laughs) We come in here and go, Lord, I love you. And if the music stops and we're in between songs, you're still worshiping him. The most beautiful times in our church is when the music quiets down up here and the voices rise out here. Man, that is powerful time. And that's what we desire, amen? Don't, let, don't just get caught into, I'm just listening to a CD singing along. No, you're not. You're worshiping the king. You want to give him everything you got. And when you give him everything you got, the Holy Spirit will flow through you and it'll be marvelous. We want God to flow in this place. We want to desire and we want to do what's biblical. We need to worship in our prayer language. We need to worship in our understanding. But what's the purpose? The purpose is understanding. So what's happening up here is leading people in understanding. People may out here just be worshiping in the spirit. That's okay. Verse 18. And then we'll finish the rest off next week. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than any of you. But in a church meeting, I would rather speak five understandable words to help others than 10,000 words in an unknown language. Here's the deal. He says, you know what, folks? This is the Apostle Paul. Everybody say, that's a big dude. This is the Apostle Paul. This is the word of God. And he says, I speak in tongues more than all of you do. Back it up. All of you speak in tongues. I do it more. That's what he's saying. But when I'm in church and I'm up front and everyone's listening to me, I want to say, I would rather say five words so people could understand what I'm teaching about Jesus than to try to show how spiritual I am. That's the key. In the church, the Apostle Paul was very concerned that every believer would experience the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Well, how do I know that? Well, let's go how he, and this is what I'm going to close with, and then we're going to sing two songs. Acts chapter 19, 25 years after the day of Pentecost, the Apostle Paul is traveling and finds a bunch of people that say they believe in God, and he immediately wants them to have more. Let's read the Bible. I'll read it right off the wall here. While Apollos was a Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions until he reached Ephesus on the coast where he found several believers. This is Apostle Paul saying this, verse 2. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed, he asked them? No, they replied, very strangely. No, they replied, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And then he asked a very interesting question, verse 3. Then 
What baptism did you experience, he asked. Why? Because when Christians are baptized, who do you hear about? I baptize you according to the authority of Jesus' name, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He was saying, you know, if you were Christian baptized, of course you heard about the Holy Spirit. They go, we didn't even hear there was one. We didn't know what's going on. Let's go to the next verse. And they replied, well, we received the baptism of John. Paul said, well, John's baptism called for repentance from sin. But John himself told the people, people to believe in the one come, that would come later, meaning in Jesus. Next verse. As soon as they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then when Paul, okay, were they saved right there? Yeah. When the apostle Paul baptizes you in water, you are born again. It's not because you're not born again because you went into the water. You're born again because you believed. And the apostle Paul said, you put your faith in Jesus, I'm going to baptize you. And then he says, now guys, there's something more about the Holy Spirit I was talking to you about. The Holy Spirit. Then when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in other tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 in all. Isn't it interesting that when the apostle Paul finds people who claim to be Christians or say they love God, the first question he asked them, hey guys, did you receive the Holy Spirit? Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you got? No, we haven't even heard about it. But in America, we're like, no dude, I really don't want to get into that kind of stuff. <laughs> that stuff. Now let me ask you a question. If we read the Bible, and the Bible tells us, that we should do what Jesus did, and we're not seeing done what Jesus said would be done, who's wrong, us or Jesus? Would you agree we're not seeing the type of ministry that Jesus had function around us? Would you agree with me on that? So what we're saying is, is that God has more than we're presently experiencing. And we have a world that wants to experience God. People are getting into all kinds of strange and bizarre religions because they're coming to the church and the church is either old and dead and not have any life in it or has a, a, a fake life. And they're just about lights and the show and the favoom. And after a while, the lights and the show are, you know what, I can go to the bar and at least have a beer. But there I gotta go, I don't, you know. People wanna experience God. They want to experience the Lord. And Jesus, it, it, in John, Luke 3.16, everybody likes John 3.16, but Luke 3.16 says, but he will baptize you, Jesus, with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Jesus, when I belong to him, he will immerse me in the Holy Spirit. He'll, I, get to, I get to tap into and be a part of all the stuff that is, is powerful and awesome. When did Jesus do his first miracle? After he was baptized in water, rose out of the water, the father said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased, and the Holy Spirit came upon him. The Holy Spirit came upon Jesus. Jesus said, you can do what I've been doing. Just ask the father and he'll do it for you. Luke chapter 11 says that if we'll ask the Lord, he will not let anything evil come to us, but will give us more of the Holy Spirit. I want us to ask God for more of the Holy Spirit. I want us to believe God for more. And let me tell you, I believe that I'm preaching these messages in preparation for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit that we have not seen. With all of my heart, I'm believing that these are preparatory messages that are preparing us and preparing the ground so that we will have a firm foundation so that others may be deceived, we will not be deceived. We want to stick to what the Bible says, not strange doctrine. We've already seen an attempt a couple of years ago by Todd Bentley down with the Lakeland outpouring. It was all fake. Good, honest, loving people showed up to praise the Lord and experience God in that, but then he got up, something went haywire, people, and many thousands of people were led astray and led into something that wasn't of God. We need to immediately go with what the Holy Spirit says, that's not of God, and stick with it, if that's what the Holy Spirit's saying. 
But if the Holy Spirit's moving and it's of God, we stick with what God says. According to the word of God, according to what our heart says, seeking wisdom, having unity in the body of Christ. Because when God pours out his Holy Spirit among us, I know that the enemy loves to come in and take any truth and run with it and go to extremes then it's my job and the job of the leadership of this church to bring correction to that, bring people back into confines of the word of God. And part of the thing that happens, the charismatic movement, I talked to a charismatic leader one time, in this charismatic movement they said the number one quality of a charismatic movement is rebellion. Pastor Rod Marquette told me that one time. He said rebellion is the highest quality. And I said, what do you mean? Because everybody just wants to do their own thing and they don't want anybody to tell them what they can't or can do. But folks, that's not God. That's why many of those things have fizzled out. And people have been hurt and there's a lot of devastation. We want to stick to the word of God. We don't want to have people go and come in and go, well, we don't need doctrine. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. Oh, no, no, no. Back up. We need very good doctrine. And we need the power of the Holy Spirit. We need it both, amen? Because you've heard it said before, all Bible, no spirit, you're gonna dry up. All Holy Spirit, no Bible, you're gonna blow up. But if you get the Bible and the Holy Spirit, you're gonna grow up. And that's gonna be our balance. Let's stand together. Let's ask God to do miracles among us. Do you want this church? Really? Are you sure? What if people don't like it? There's an old, old song called Come Holy Spirit, I Need You. I'm going to put the words up. I don't know if I got the right key. It was a great old song. Let's lower the lights a little bit. Let's sing that song to the Lord. It's in the, it's in the computer, guys. It's preloaded. Can we pull up Come Holy Spirit? It's an old, old song. And let's just ask the Lord to move among us today. It goes like this.